enliven me, Lord, enliven me. You may uh, call your hearts and minds to attention. Stand if you so desire where you are as we sing our gospel acclamation led by Mike Lemke. Thanks, Mike. gospel according to Matthew, and we all say, glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, Take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't always start my sermons that way, but it does seem in these weeks where we're getting these readings about how we should be in relationship with one another, it's just good to call on the Lord and bless the Lord and cross ourselves before we begin. Last week, maybe you were with us. We heard the call from Jesus to take up our cross. I so showed you some of my crosses. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow Jesus. Now, for a few weeks here, we'll hear messages about what it looks like, what it's like to navigate relationships within a community of people who are trying to live with those crosses up on our shoulders. Our gospel text today, as Jesus is teaching, deals with the reality that people, even faithful Jesus followers, will sin. Amen? We'll sin against our siblings in Christ, against others, against even ourselves. Jesus is teaching the disciples as they sit at his feet, I imagine. It's teaching them about shepherding new followers who are being taught a new way of living, worshiping, and being in relationship. So like students of a new skill or method, they will misstep, right? They, they might revert back to old habits or doubt their ability to fulfill the calling that is set before them. Now the text here doesn't say exactly what sin means. So as we have this conversation this morning, we're acknowledging that there's a whole spectrum of sins as we seek to find meaning in this text for our own time and our own community. So when someone, especially a fellow Christian, offends us, hurts us, hurts our feelings, does something we don't agree with, or is making decisions that we think are out of step, with bearing the cross of Christ, what do we do? I'd like to say that in my personal life, 
that I have the presence of mind always and the maturity to first and in a timely way go to that person and deal with the issue outright in a respectful way, stating my case, hopeful for reconciliation. Maybe you're snickering to yourself a little bit as you think about your own circumstances. There are so many ways that conflict in my life and maybe yours as well veers far from this clear cut style of face to face confrontation. It's hard, isn't it, to have a conversation with someone when we want to address a point of conflict or concern. And how many of us really feel that we're equipped to have conversations like that without getting completely overwhelmed by emotion or ending up just wagging fingers, nagging, or totally putting someone else on the defensive? And maybe when faced with conflict, we second guess ourselves. If I'm going to approach somebody and point out a sin, I better be sure that I'm right. And who am I to call them out anyway? So maybe we end up just avoiding the one-on-one -on -one confrontations with people, opting instead to stew over the incident, grumble about it to friends, or start harboring judgments about or grudges towards the offender. Then we're likely to just kind of skip over verses 15 and 16 that talk about this this face-to-face -face confrontation and move right on to that part that says, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Yeah, now we're talking. That sounds pretty good, actually. Like Jewish culture considered Gentiles or people from the other nations to be outsiders, untrustworthy, and tax collectors were their own people that were considered to be traitors because they were collect collecting taxes for Caesar. So they were also untrustworthy and unworthy of respect. So we can just cut people out of our lives who sin against us or against others, right? They're dead to me, outside of the community. Let's just move on. Well, that might feel good for a minute. Maybe it takes a little less energy initially, but that sure doesn't sound like something that Jesus would be encouraging us to do. So we might have to go back to that verse. Let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Well, let's talk about who Gentiles and tax collectors were to Jesus, the speaker here. Remember that story about Zacchaeus, the tax collector, up in the tree? He's a little bit short, so he scrambles up the tree to see Jesus. And Jesus says to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. Don't hide. Don't be ashamed. I'm going to have dinner at your house. That's who tax collectors are to Jesus, people to engage with, people to commune with. Or remember a few weeks ago after Jesus' interaction with the Canaanite woman, Jesus is then encouraged to listen to and care for instead of ignore the Gentiles, as well as the lost children of the house of Israel. So who are the Gentiles and the tax collectors to Jesus and therefore to the disciples and therefore to us? Who are they? Well, they're sinners and saints. They're people Jesus lived for and dined with. They're people Jesus died for. They're people Jesus rose for. They are people to whom Jesus offers forgiveness, second chances, third chances, eternal life, eternal love. They're people like you and me people who deserve to be seen, heard, and engaged with respect, care, prayer, and Holy Spirit love. They're people who may need more attention and more energy from us than those who are in good standing with the fellowship in Christ. So this brings us back around to verses 15 and 16, that call to talk to one another, to address those things that we might want to ignore. But what happens when we ignore them? They fester and harden into anger and resentment. We're going to talk about that next week. For our congregation here at Faith Lutheran and for our governing bodies of the New England Synod, that's our, our regional governing body, and then the national body, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, there are protocols and procedures when a leader or a worshiper steps way out of bounds. And those are based on this model of being open, honest, and having witnesses and talking things out. 
there are workshops and professionals, maybe you know this in your professional settings, there's books and resources about conflict resolution, right? Using active listening, using I statements, I feel such and such when you do such and such. There's ways that we can learn how to use mediators to resolve difficult situations. But for us today, this text might drive us to ask, what kind of community and what kind of people are we called to be in Jesus? This is not just about calling someone out because they rub us the wrong way. This is not permission to rudely confront someone because they sat in your pew. Not that we've been doing much of that recently. This is not about independently trying to confront an abuser or someone who threatens your physical, mental, or emotional health. This does not mean that you should be alone in raising concerns around unfair treatment in a workplace or a school setting or even a family situation. So what does it mean? This does mean that we are called as community in Jesus to work it out, to talk it out, to be forthright with one another, even when that's scary. Because I don't know about you, but in, our, in the culture that I live in, that face-to-face -face confrontation doesn't really seem normal. This does, this does mean for us that instead of bleeding out energy, being mad about something, we should address the issue. Seek trusted confidants like your pastor or a fellow worshiper who will accompany you, not just towards griping and whining, but towards constructive conflict resolution. This does mean that we seek to cultivate healthy relationships within the church so that most of our energy may go towards mission, outreach, speaking forthrightly to powers that are oppressive, sharing the good news of Jesus with the broader community. This does mean constantly seeking the word of God as the psalmist talks about, that we might sit together like the disciples at the feet of Jesus and keep learning. Teach me, Lord, that we might keep growing and that we might be enlivened by God's saving word so that we can be beloved community now and for all eternity. Amen. Our hymn of the day today is one that we sang not really that long ago, but it seemed very fitting for us as we pray about how to be in community with one another. Blessed be the tie that binds. And Mike Lemke will again lead us. Thank you, Mike. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the unity of heart and mind is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our And perfect 
love and friendship reign. 